Hello everyone, and I hope that you're doing great today. Now today I'm going to run through this CSEC biology pass paper. This is a 2015 paper one, but I find it to have some really good information, and so I'm going to go through it and explain some of the questions as well. And so this paper, I find it to be a good paper to use to practice. And please remember before you start the examination to go through the instructions carefully and make sure you understand the instruction, especially to shade in the answers, all right, and how to shade them in. Very important. Again, please to ensure to fill out your information sheet before you begin. So the first instruction is that items 1 to 2 refer to the following diagrams labeled 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 found in a school garden. Now, this is a kind of a popular question, right? And the question read for number one, it said, which of the following characteristics could be used to classify these organisms into two groups. So the number of wings is the best answer here, right? And the reason being, because if you look at the diagram carefully, look at especially even number four, you realize that there's no wings. So you could have those with wings and those without wings, all right? Now, some of the papers that I, that I have reviewed, they ask you how could you classify them in terms of them being insecta, in that case, the segmented body would be the best option. All right? But they ask you for two groups. So those with wings and those without wings. All right? All right. So uh, all of them will have antennas, so they'll be in the same group. Um, the number of legs will be the same. So yes, they'll be in the same group for those. So B, C, and D will put them only into one group. But A, those with wings, those without wings. Now, for number two, it said that the distribution of the organism labeled one could be best studied, well, could be studied using what? And um, this is a grasshopper here for diagram one, and grasshopper will be moving, so nets will be best to capture the grasshopper, right? A quadrat used for um, immotile organisms or slow-moving organisms such as um, slug or snail, all right, and plants, small plants. All right, so yeah, so D is good. All right, so for item three, refers to the following food web from a tropical forest. And if you go through the food web carefully, just identify the different um, food chains, it would be best for you to understand this question. And it said, the list of herbivores in the food web includes what? All right, and so um, I highlight the ones that will make B, C, and D incorrect. Because herbivores, as you know, they will feed directly on the producer, which is the tree in this case. So beetle, bird, and snake, they are not herbivores, all right? They're not feeding directly on the tree. And so answer option A will be correct. The iguana, if you notice the iguana, um, the parasitic vine, um, larvae, and the butterfly, they all feed directly on the producer. So they are herbivores. All right, item four refers to, refers to the following relationship between some organisms. And so we have here barnacles on a shark back, on a shark's back. We have shark slash man, man, malaria, protozoan. All right, and so question number four said, which of the following correctly identifies these relationship. And so the barnacle and the shark back is commensalism. The shark and the man, oh Lord, um, that is a prayer to pray. All right. And the man and the malaria protozoan will be a parasitic um, relationship. Um, the malaria protozoa will be a parasite. All right. In the case of shark and man, the man will more likely be, well, depends. Um, the man will more likely be the prey. The shark is the predator. Well, of course, you know, man will hunt shark as well and use shark um, for certain things, for food in some places. So it could be the, the other way around. Yep. Um, and of course, uh, commensalism there, um, the shark and the barnacle. All right, the barnacle is benefiting, but the shark is not being harmed. All right, so number five. It said, which of the following statements about a food chain is true? And 
going through the options, you realize that option C is not of a bad answer. But the problem with number with option C is that you're talking about the energy changes from heat to light, which is not heat to light. It's really light to chemical. So the heat in that um, statement make it incorrect. But option A is beautiful because it's saying energy from the sun is transferred from one organism, which is the producer, to the subsequent subsequent organisms, and those are the consumers. All right, so all the organisms that will come after the producer, they are all called consumer. All right, so the subsequent organisms refer to the consumers in this case. All right, for question number six, it said, uh, for which of the following would plants not compete? All right, and um, plants do not compete for food. And the reason for that, because they make their own food. But to make their food, they will compete for water in the soil because the roots will be all over the place. And so if plants are too close, then they compete for water. They also compete for light. So plants are packed together. Some of them will shade the others. And so some will get more light than others. And so also space is important for plants as well. Plants should not be planted too, too close because they will compete for resources. So food, they do not compete because they make their own. All right. Now, items seven to eight refer to the following diagram, which represents an animal cell seen under an electron microscope. Some cells, some cell structures are labeled uh, A, B, C, and D. All right. But I put the, 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 the names for those parts. We have the nucleus, we have the cytoplasm, we have the vacuole, we have the mitochondria. All right. And I said, in answering items seven to eight, each option may be used once, more than once, or not at all. And I said, um, which of the structures for number seven is responsible for energy production? And it will be D, which is the mitochondria. And eight, it said, consists mainly of water. And that will be option C, which is a vacuole, because vacuole stores water, food, and also waste. All right? Question number nine, it said, which of the following pairs of phrases uh, does not distinguish between plants and animal cells? And for plant cells, uh, they have no, um, they said have no cell membrane and animal cells have cell membrane. That is not true because notice the question said not, does not distinguish between them. And plant cells, they do have cell membrane, all right? So that is not making sense in terms of a good answer. But for option A, plants have chloroplasts, animal cells do not have chloroplasts, so that is a correct statement. Um, for B, it said contains large vacuole and is a single centrally located vacuole for plant cells. So yes, that is correct. And animal cells have few vacuoles, so more than one, and they are smaller. All right, and for option D, um, plant cells do contain cellulose cell wall, and animal cells do not have cell walls, all right? And so option C is correct because even the one for plant doesn't make any sense. All right, for item number 10 and 11, refer to the following graph which shows the activity of two enzymes in the human digestive system. And we have enzyme 1 and enzyme 2. We have the activity, enzyme activity on the y-axis and the pH on the x-axis. And so number 10 reads, it said enzyme 1 will function best in where? And if you notice that enzyme 1 is highest, notice this point right here is highest at this point, which means it is highest under acidic conditions. All right, because remember from number 1 to number 6 is acidic, and 7 is neutral, and above 7 is alkalinic or basic. And so the stomach is acidic, so definitely... Um, the stomach will be great, all right? And um, enzyme two, just to make mention of that, is highest on the alkalinic, alkalinic conditions, and so that would be best under the small intestine or in the small intestine, all right? So enzyme A will work best in the stomach. Enzyme two will be best in the small intestine. All right, question number 11. It said, which of the following is most likely enzyme two? And the answer here is, Trypsin. Trypsin is produced by the pancreas and pancreatic enzymes. They work in the small intestine. All right. Pepsin work in the stomach cannot be 
Renin is used to digest milk, especially stomach of ruminants. And ruminants will be organisms with four stomachs, such as um, goat, sheep, cows, right? And so um, to digest milk, especially in the, in the young um, animals of ruminants, so definitely that is a stomach um, enzymes as well. And amylase, and the problem with amylase, amylase um, could work, but the problem with amylase is too general here because you have salivary amylase and you have pancreatic amylase. Pancreatic amylase could have been um, enzyme too, but it wasn't specified what amylase it is. So I have to go with trypsin for sure, all right? Because pancreatic amylase works on the alkalinic conditions, while salivary amylase work more under a neutral condition. All right, so C is the best option right there. Number 12 and 13, uh, based on this diagram, so items 12 to 13, refer to the following diagram, which represents a metabolic process carried out in plants. And we know what the process this is because if you notice what is going in, light is going in, carbon dioxide is going in, you get oxygen out and food out, which is glucose. And this is a nice, good diagram here that, sh that represents um, photosynthesis. Because if you notice in the central part in the circle, you see chlorophyll in chloroplast. So definitely is a process of photosynthesis. But number 12. It said the oxygen shown in the diagram comes from the what? All right. And so the oxygen comes from water. And we know that because light, I noticed the notation on the right, it's a light split water molecules into hydrogen ions and oxygen. So definitely when water split, then they form H plus ions and O2, which is oxygen gas that is released as a waste. All right. So oxygen do, um, really comes from water. 13, it said, it, it said, to which of the following groups does the food produce belong? And it is glucose producing, so it is sugar, and it is also a carbohydrate. All right, so definitely A is the correct answer for that one. And next on the list is the items 14 to 15, refer to the following diagrams, X and Y. It said, which illustrate an experiment on a metabolic process taking place in light. And we know what this process is. This metabolic process is photosynthesis because it's a taking place in light, all right? All right. And so just to make mention of the word metabolic, metabolic refers to chemical reactions in living organisms, all right? All right. So respiration is a metabolic process. Deamination is a metabolic process. Respiration is a metabolic process, all right? All right. So number 14. And so the aim of the experiment is to investigate what? All right. And the reason why C is correct, let me just go back to the diagram here. If you notice in, the, in X, you have the distilled water. You have a plastic bag. You have the bell jar and you have the plant inside of the, the jar itself. And light is present, of course, based on the instruction. And in Y, you see potassium hydroxide instead. Potassium hydroxide um, will remove carbon dioxide, all right? It absorbs carbon dioxide, so no carbon dioxide will be available in the jar for the plant to carry out photosynthesis. So we know that this is testing if carbon dioxide is important or necessary for photosynthesis, and that's why option C is correct, all right? If there was no potassium hydroxide and they say light is there and then there is no light, so one is covered. If, if they say bell jar Y was covered with a a big object, you know, then we know that they will be testing light. All right, so number 15. Before the experiment is set up, the plants are placed in a dark cupboard for about 24 hours. This step is necessary for what? And the purpose for this, if you put it in the dark, is to ensure that any starch produced is removed from the leaf. That means there is no um, product of photosynthesis. All right? All right, for number 16, it said, which of the following is important in a diet to develop strong bones and teeth? And here it is calcium. Calcium is important. All right, and it said, in our diet. Um, for option C, which is vitamin D, because vitamin D is also important um, as well. But the problem is, it's not a dietary um, substance. It is produced in the skin when exposed to sunlight. But in your diet, calcium for sure. 
Number 17, he said, which of the following organs involved in digestion produces no digestive enzymes? And the answer here is liver because liver produces bile and bile is not an enzyme. It is actually a salt. All right, but stomach produces um, pepsin, pancreas. The pancreas produces um, pancreatic amylase, trypsin, and lipase. And the ileum will produce maltase that will break down maltose. All right, that comes from starch. Now, 18. It said the products of aerobic respiration are carbon dioxide and water. All right, um, so those are the products of respiration. And then we have number 19. It said after vigorous exercise, the muscles involved show a marked increase in the concentration of what? And so going through vigorous exercise anaerobically, then what's going to happen here? We're going to produce a lot of lactic acid right? because we will undergo anaerobic respiration in our muscle. It's actually called lactic acid fermentation. All right? And that is when you have little to no oxygen because, well, not little to no oxygen. The oxygen is not reaching the cells quick enough. And so we undergo what they call um, oxygen debt. All right, so item 20 to 22 refer to the following diagrams of a model showing how breathing takes place. And I labeled um, the different structures. The glass tube represents the trachea, rubber bung. There we have the balloon represents the lungs or alveoli or alveolus in this case in singular. And then we have the, the, the caging or the housing of the apparatus represents the rib cage. And the plunger represents the diaphragm. Now question number 20 said the part of the model which represents the diaphragm is that will be the rubber bung, um, sorry, the plunger, I should say, um, for, for the diaphragm, all right? And now 21, he said, which of the following would most likely occur when the plunger is moved in the direction of the arrow shown in the diagram above? And if a plunger is going downwards, then what will happen here is that the rib cage move is, uh, moves down, and so the balloon will be inflated, will be filled with air, all right? And so the balloon will expand 21 is option A. Now for 22, it said when the plunger is moved, the balloon function like the what? And it function like the alveolus. And it could be the lungs as well, right? All right, so 23, it said the following are descriptions of blood vessels. We have one, it's a thin wall, large lumen, which is a space or the bore or the, or the opening. Um, it said takes blood away from organs and tissues. Um, so that one is representing a vein for sure. It's a thin wall vessels adapted for diffusion um, close to cells, and that will be our capillaries. And then the next one is said, thick walls, small lumen, takes blood to organs, and that will represent the arteries. And so if you look at the option there, option B is correct. Veins, capillary, and artery. But 24, I said the function of valves in veins is to, and the function of this will be to prevent the backflow of blood. That's the purpose of valves in veins. And now for 25, we said when a person receives a vaccine in her immune system, it stimulate, it's stimulated to produce what? All right, and so... Um, once you get the vaccine, it stimulates the production of antibodies, all right? Because antibodies will work again what they call, against what they call antigens. And so let's look at option A, antigens. And those are proteins and pathogen that trigger the production of antibodies, right? Antibiotics is just a medication to fight bacterial infection and kill bacteria, all right? And antitoxins, they neutralize um, toxin or poison, all right? Now, it said one type, Sorry, he said, on what type of day is the rate of transpiration likely to be the lowest? And that will be when it is cool and cloudy because it have less um, evaporation because the sun rays will be blocked to, to reduce um, evaporation. For 27, he said, the kidney, in the kidney, blood vessels absorb most water from where? And that will be the loop of Henley. 
All right, so look at this diagram, question number 20 and 29 refer to this diagram. All right, I'm going to go through this um, really quickly. All right, so looking at the diagram, uh, we notice we see the cortex, the medulla, the renal pelvis, and we have the ureter. All right, and so here it said, um, da, 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 da. it said match each of the items below with one of the parts labeled above, and it said each part may be used once, more than once, or not at all. And so for question number 28, it said, site for site of urine collections, and that is a collecting duct in the kidney that collect urine. Um, and so option C will be in the pelvis, um, the renal pelvis. All right. And so just to make a note right there is that filtration and reabsorption are complete by that time. So you have urine formation in by it reaches the renal pelvis. And remember that the collecting duct is where urine will be first formed or stored. All right. And so it's a site of osmoregulation. And site of osmoregulation will be in the medulla. And the, per and the reason for this is because most of the tubules are located in the medulla. All right. And remember that if you think about the nephron of the kidney in terms of the movement of substances, then by that time, you have reabsorption of water. All right. And water will be stored again in the collecting duct. And you remember, just to make a note, that you should also know what happened to water content in terms of hot day versus on a cold day. All right. In terms of sweating versus urination. All right, so next question here is question number 30. I said item 30 refers to the following diagram, which represents a seedling growing in the dark. All right, and it said the pumule of a seedling is showing a what? All right, so a point here, you know, because we have two questions that see, well, two options that seem really good. And so for option A, which is uh, the best answer, it's a negative response to gravity. All right, and option D, which is a positive response to light. Um, generally, pumule will be responding to light when it is germinating above the ground. But before, Germany, before it reaches to the top of the soil, then there is no light penetrating the soil. And so for, for that reason, the pumule will start to grow up because it is um, negatively um, um, geotropic. Because remember, the response to gravity is geotropic or geotropism, all right? And response to light is phototropism. And so pumule grows against gravity. So it is negatively geotropic, all right? And the, the, the radical, which is the young root, will grow in the direction of gravity. So it is positively geotropic, all right? So you need to know the difference um, between the structures and what is happening at different stages. All right, and so a point to note here as I make notation is that the seed is under the earth, away from light, and so the pumule has to grow against gravity. All right, and a point to note here is that no, uh, no need for photosynthesis in the response to gravity because the, 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 the pumule is not photosynthesizing, but it's a good mechanism to push the pumule above the earth. So when, it's, when, it, when it develops, it can start to photosynthesize as it exposed to the sunlight. Now, item 31 refers to the following diagram, which shows the skeleton of a human arm. And we have um, bones um, Y and X labeled there. All right, and so during performance of vigorous exercise, bone X slipped out of the socket in bone Y. That must be really painful. And that's a dislocation right there. It said, beside in, besides experiencing pain, the individual would most likely be unable to do what? All right, and so if the dislocation, this is very important to, to understand this, all right, and it said, flex the arm. Um, the arm could be flexed because the, the bicep and tricep still work, if you notice that, that's for option A, and so you could, have, you could still have muscle movement, all right, but does the bone move? Now, to so straighten the arm, the bicep, and triceps still work to do that as well. So it's pretty much similar to option A. 
Now for C, to swing the arm, because that deals with rotation. And so since the, since, since, since the ball and socket is not together, the rotation will be really, really difficult or impossible. All right? And pick up a pencil, that will be easy. Um, because to pick up a pencil, your fingers will be gripping the pencil to lift it up. All right? So definitely um, C is the correct answer right there. Number 32 is that which part of the body do drugs affect most? And even even to think about it, um, take taking drugs, then you become pretty much um, brainless. Your thinking is is out of whack, you know. Um, so it affects your brain, right? Your brain, your thinking, your balance, and everything else. Um, drugs is not good. Stay away from uh, from drugs. Um, definitely not good. All right, so you become brainless pretty pretty much. Well, technically not brainless, but I mean senseless. Because your brain function, your cognitive skills will be will be out of whack, you know. Um, that's that's you look notice those people on the road you see sometimes that are drug addicts. You realize how they behave, you know. They just crave for drugs and they do nonsense. All right, they do not think rational. All right, so item number thirty-three. Refer to the following diagram of a reflex arc. We said with parts labeled A, B, C, and D. And I label these, and so just to make a note right here, um, this is a good thing right here at A, look like an ear. I don't know what it is, but look like an ear. But it really doesn't matter, but it's a sense organ as far as I'm concerned, right? But how do I know that is because look at B, B will be a sensory neuron, and, and how we know it because we see the cell body on the side of the neuron. And within the spinal cord, where all the three nerves will connect or um, link. We will have our relay neuron in the middle right there. And C will be our motor neuron carrying impulse to the muscle for movement and actions. And then D will be a muscle for sure. And so question number 33 now reads, which part of the reflex arc takes messages to the central nervous system? And that has to be B. Because the central nervous system is the spinal cord. All right? As a matter of fact, let's, make, let's give you a full answer here. This, the central nervous system is made up of the brain and spinal cord. But only the spinal cord is shown here in the reflex arc. So the spinal cord, B is carrying impulse into the spinal cord. So it moves from the sense organ into the sensory neuron, then the relay neuron, then to the motor neuron, and then to the muscles. And please remember that in the sense organ, you have receptor cells. And in the muscles, you have what they call effector cells. All right? So those are things you can add if they should ask you to explain the reflex arc or how impulse travel through the reflex arc. All right, let's go to question number 34. It said, which of the following sequences um, is the correct pathway of a reflex action? All right? Kind of what I just mentioned up there. And you'd have the stimulus first, then you have the receptor in the sense organ, then it will eventually go through all the neurons to the effector, and then you will have a response. All right? Now, and this is a summary of the entire arc, as a matter of fact. Now, for 35, it said the central nervous system consists of the brain and the spinal cord, which I mentioned up top, so no need to stop there too, too long. 36, it said, which of the following is not, a, is not true about drugs? And it said that all are legally available to citizens. Um, no, not at all. Medications are also drugs, by the way, just to make mention um, to it, right? Um, drugs can become addictive, for sure. They alter normal body functions, definitely. They may cause liver damage and heart disease, for sure. So even medication, you should take them based on prescriptions and um, also read instructions even for those over-the-counter medication you need to read the instructions and take them well some of them you should not um, take and operate machine or drive because they can actually alter your brain functions your cognitive skills your motor skills and all of those things so yeah um, some of them are legal some are not all right 37 so which of the following structures are involved in the regulation of blood temperature in humans? And um, the arterioles, definitely. 
um, the sweat glands, the ear erector muscle. Um, the arterioles, those are found in the skin, and you can just review um, vasodilation and vasoconstriction um, in terms of maintaining homostasis, homostasis in terms of temperature. All right, sweat glands are produced for the cooler body as well. The hair erector um, muscles will keep the ear either laying down on the skin or, or keep them straight when you're cold. All right, and so you can also review that as well. 38. Is that during the menstrual cycle, the egg is most likely to be released on day 14, is the answer. And day 14 is the midpoint of the uh, menstrual cycle. So ovulation occurs about midway of the menstrual cycle. And please remember the menstrual cycle is 28 days long. Um, period or menstruation will only take about 5 to 7 days. All right, so know, know the difference and go through those as well. 39. It's that when one side of the stem of a plant is illuminated, which means light is applied, the plant grows where? And it will grow towards the light because oxygen will move to the darker side of the stem and it causes more growth on the darker side. Hence, the plant will bend towards the light. Now, 40. So which of the following is associated with germination and germination for you to germinate, for seed to germinate, it needs water. All right, so increase in water content. Increase in food stored? No, because the stored food will be used up for the germination reactions and activities. All right, for seeds, a decrease metabolic activity? No, because when the seed is dormant before it starts germinate, you have less chemical activities taking place, or chem less chemical reactions. But when the seeds start to germinate now, the metabolic reactions um, start to increase because, for example, the stored food will start to break down by enzymes and so on. Right? Respiration will start taking place and all of that good list stuff. Not photosynthesis, though, for germination. Respiration takes place for germination, not photosynthesis. Please not get them confused, all right? Now, for the one, so which of the following is not used to measure growth in plants? And um, A is correct. It's a total volume of all the organs. All right. Um, again, just go back to the question and make sure I understand. It said, which of the following is not used to measure growth in plant? All right. And so, um, because, for example, let's say you have a plant that is in water, you're going to be very turgid. The cells will be turgid. So, Water, is, water will go into cells and make them really, really turgid, and the plant may have a greater mass and so on. But that is, an indicate, is not an indication of growth at all. But the number of leaves on the plant, because more leaves mean that you have more new cells, because leaves will produce, more leaves will produce mean that more cells were made. Because if you remember what growth is, and notice the notation in blue, growth is a permanent increase in size due to the production of new cells. So, all right, so uptake of water is not producing new cells, but the plant can become more turgid, large, and look larger, and look more brighter as well. Um, change in the, in the fresh mass of all the organs, um, yes, because we think about biomass, definitely is making more cells to gain more mass. All right, a change in the dry mass of all the organs as well, yes, because after you remove all the water, um, the actual cell content that are there, will determine the amount of cells, and the more cells they have is the greater the dry mass as well. Now for 42, a seed develops from the what? And it develops from the over, from the ovule, all right? And the ovule is situated in the ovary, all right? The ovary forms the fruit, so you can make a note of that. Ovary forms the fruit, ovules, they form the seeds. So when you're eating a fruit, Technically, you're eating a developed ovary, right? Well, keep eating the fruits. It's, it's a good, good thing. Fruits, very good in producing the vitamins and certain minerals, yeah? Um, and fiber as well from fruits. Now, 43. It's a, which of the following is a requirement for sexual reproduction? And for sexual reproduction, you must have the production of gametes. I don't think I need to explain anything there. All right, you need to produce gametes for sexual reproduction, sperms and egg cells. 44, is that asexual reproduction gives rise to genetically identical offspring because of what? 
And there are two answers here that really, really look really, really good answers, I must say. Um, option A and B, they're out because a single cell divides by, by uh, meiosis is incorrect because meiosis produce gametes. So a is totally nonsense. Um, B, it said only half the chromosomes are involved, which is not true. That is also sexual reproduction. But for option C, which I really, really like option C, it said all the chromosomes are from one parent, which is true. Because if only one parent involved, you get, only, you get the chromosome only from that parent, right? And option D is that all cell divisions are by mitosis. Mitosis do produce um, identical um, offspring. But however, uh, mitosis is not the only process for asexual reproduction. Binary fission is also another way for asexual reproduction. And binary fission occur in um, bacteria, for example. But option D um, may take precedence over option A because if you think about binary fission, it's a little bit different from mitosis, a little slightly different. All right, so once you have identical um, offspring, it has to be mitosis, and all the chromosomes will come from one parent. So I guess any of those answers should be correct. But I like option C, but option D is also good if it's only produced by mitosis. All right, and so I guess you can choose any, I think. All right. Um... Um, matter of fact, let me, if, when I consider this for real, I think I lean more towards a D answer for sure. All right. Because again, um, if the chromosomes come from one parent and there's any form of mutation, then you can have a variation in that as well. Um, and of course, binary fission could give you um, some form of variation in terms of bacteria and what they're exposed to. And if you have mutation taking place, yep. Um, but mitosis, as we know it, always produce identical cells. So if it's only referring to mitosis, then yeah, option D could, could, could be go. I think that's why I give it a green. All right. Now for 45, is after leaving the vast difference, which is a sperm duct, right? Sp um, spermatozoa enter the what? And it enters, um, spermatozoa will enter the urethra. That is on its way out of the male's body. All right, the epididymis is what's storing the sperm cells, and that is just after the testes, all right, our testicles, you may call them, and the testes, um, they are what producing the um, sperm cells. The ureter is not involved in the transmission or transportation of spermatozoa or sperm cells. The ureter is dealing with urine. Now, 46, it said fertilization of the ovum takes place in the oviduct. As you know, it's called the fallopian tube as well. That's where the sperms and egg meet. All right. And now 47, it said, which of the following is considered a male hormone? And testosterone is absolutely correct. And a point to note, estrogen and progesterone, as you also know, um, those are found in females and follicle stimulating hormones they actually are in both male and female because they stimulate um, sperm production if it's male and stimulate the development of the egg or follicle in the female. Now for 48, they said, which of the following means of birth control is most effective in preventing sexual transmitted infections and condom definitely? Pills, diaphragm, sperm, um, spermicide, those are important in terms of killing the sperms or preventing the sperm from entering. Um, but a condom for both um, pregnancy or fertilization and STIs as well. 49. Animals assist with um, we have pollination and seed dispersal for sure. Um, yep. All right, for both of them because seed dispersal is moving the seed from where it's located of an appearing plant to a different location. Um, so some animals will eat fruit and then carry the fruit, um, the seed with them and, and release the, this, the seed somewhere else. Uh, for example, you picking a mango, for example, you eat the mango, you toss the seed somewhere else, that's seed dispersal, and the mango tree may grow somewhere else. All right, Pollination, like for um, 
B, and so on, butterflies, yeah. Now, 50, it said the observable physical, biochemical characteristic or traits of an organism are referred to as its, and that is phenotype. Because physical is the physical things that you can see. Those are phenotypes, such as the ear color, your ear texture, your, your, your complexion, your eye color, those things, your height. Those are your physical traits. Now, 51, it said, which of the following is an example of a discontinuous variation or trait? And uh, so a discontinuous trait is something that you will be one or the other. All right? And so, for example, if male and female, that's discontinuous. There's no in-between. All right? Um, but for the continuous ones, those will change over time and are affected by the environmental factors. And so your foot size, for example, can change over a period of time. Your height may change over a period of time. Your intelligence may change over time. So once you study and study well, then, yeah, you become more intelligent. Or, you know, you practice um, certain things. And the more you practice, you become better at it. So that is also intelligence as well. Um, your brain power increases as you study, like you're doing now. So definitely, you learn one or two more things or, you know, it kind of reminds you of certain things. So yes, those are continuous variation. All right, so 52. As a genetic variation is important because it, what? And so here, option A is correct. They provide a basis of natural selection. And just to make mention of natural selection, right? Matter of fact, let me go to the word variation first. As you know what it is, variation is a difference among species in an ecosystem. All right? So the same species with differences. And so natural selection, however, now, I'm going to give it in a very simple way. And remember this um, phrase, the fittest of the fittest will survive. And so if you have the same species with different traits, then if you should have a change in the environment, in the environment, whichever organism is better adapt to that change will survive. The one that can't adapt will die and become extinct. And so if you have variation, then some may survive, some won't. And so for natural selection is based upon variation. All right? And... Um, Allow for survival against disease. If all the organisms are the same and there's no variation, then all will die. All right? And so definitely. Um, provide antibiotic resistance. Um, like, for example, in bacteria, that could be an answer, but that's not the main cause for variation or importance for variation because we do not want to have antibiotic resistance bacteria. Not at all, right? All right. Um, 53. Is that which of the following isolation mechanism could lead to speciation, and um, this is splitting into two different um, species. That's what it means. All right, and so geographical um, means mean to separate by barriers or landmass. And so, if you're separated by barriers or landmass, then for sure, um, behavioral, which means separated by actions such as mating season or pattern, definitely. So if your mating seasons are different, then you're going to have different type of uh, mating. And so you won't be able to transmit characteristics or traits or genes from one organism to the next. And so we have ecological as well, which means separated by habitat. And so once organisms are separated, then definitely their, their characteristics or traits cannot mix. And so definitely you have um, isolation of the... Um, isolation and it leads to different species forming. All right. And so all the options are actually correct. Now, for 54, he said, which of the following terms best describe two or more forms of the same gene? And they said forms. And that is very important here. Two or more forms of the same genes. And that will be the alleles. Remember that alleles are variation of genes. All right. Diploid is thus simple means the full number of chromosomes. And chromatids is just the um, segments or arms of a chromosomes. And chromosomes are genetic um, structures, the third like structures found in cells that carry genes. All right. And number 55 is said, which of the following processes does not form part of meiosis? And um, recombination is um, that takes place by crossing over. 
that's recombination. That's when um, genetic materials are exchanged um, between um, two different chromosomes, especially when they form tetrads, and that occur in meiosis one. All right, and notice here we see prophase one, that's a specific part of meiosis one it takes place. All right, that's the notation in blue. And segregation is one of each gene pair goes to a gamete, that's when they separate. So definitely chromosomes or genes are separating, and one will go to the gamete. And that's why gametes, they have half the number of chromosomes, right? Now, independent assortment, again, alleles of different genes are, in are inherited um, independently, all right? Uh, it's supposed to be not an I, but a T. Let me quickly change that. Um, they are inherited, inherited independently. Uh-oh. All right. That's, that's if I get this in. All right. Cool. That's supposed to be a T right there. All right. Number 56. Um, this is saying now that which of the following describes the sex chromosome in humans? And for females, it's X and X. And for males, it is X and Y. And that is why um, your gender is pretty much a primary um, characteristic. Your chromosomes defines you, male or female, in a primary way. Now, as you get to puberty, then your testosterone or estrogen, if you're a female, will determine your sexual characteristics, such as development of breast, production of sperm cells, production of egg cells. Those are secondary characteristics to determine gender. But the primary characteristic is your chromosome. Your X and X if you're if you're if you're a female and X and Y if you are male. Number 57 is that which of the following best describe the process of evolution? And evolution is really a change um, of organisms over a long period of time. And so option B is correct. Um, for um, option A, it's the development of characteristics in response to need, and that will be an adaptation. All right and um, development of population due to natural selection. Um, that again, as we mentioned earlier, that is due to variation. All right, so evolution is option B, change from simple to complex organisms. That could kind of explain evolution, but it must be over time. All right, now 58. It's a biological evolution is best defined as B. And this is a change in gene frequency in population over time. So that, that very important, the, the gene frequency. Or oh, often you will see a certain gene or a certain trait. The trait may, in, may become different over a period of time. That's what it's really saying. All right? And so um, B is the correct answer. 59, they said, which of the following provide supporting evidence for biological evolution? And fossil records, yep, may show the evolutionary stage, DNA or genetic materials, definitely, because you see a change in those as well over time. The vestigial traits, and vestigial traits will be, for example, remains or remnants of um, structures um, that has no use. And so, for example, two of them in us, for example, our tonsils, um, as they will say that there is no true purpose for it even though the tans will produce some form of um, um, white blood cells to kind of kill germs as you eat food. And so um, your appendix is also a next one as well um, because there is no use for it. Wisdom teeth is also another one. So option D is correct. Now, for number 60, it says which of the following is the first step in the production of insulin using the recombinant DNA? And option A is important. You remove the plasmid from the E. coli bacteria. And the plasmid is the circular DNA. As you remember, just one chromosome, one circular chromosome that contains DNA. All right. And so you have to remove that first. Um, if you look at option B, say by DNA coding for human insulin inserted in the plasmid, that will be afterwards. That, up, that will be the third step, actually. So what comes after A will be D, which is plasmid is open um, by special enzyme. And then what you're going to do is the plasmid is closed by special enzyme. That's when you reinsert um, the actual gene that you want into it. And again, this is also a popular question and one of the past papers as well. So at this time, we're at the end of the review. And I want to wish you luck on the upcoming exams. 
And I also encourage you to subscribe and share with your friends. All right, so at least they get a chance as well to study. All right, so at this time, take care and good luck again. All right, thank you for being here.